the mail Get come a rotten bail Too much monkey business Too much monkey business There's too much monkey business For me to be in my Okay, well, we'll get this part uh, In the movie, I, I don't talk for two of them So we'll get to the movie fairly soon uh, Good evening and welcome to the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Gardens 2010 Summer Camp Film Festival. Uh, my name is David Wilt, and I'll be your host for the next three weeks of exploitation of obsidian cinema, monkey movies, primate pictures, hair tales, gorilla movies, and all the above. Um, this is the sixth year that the Hirshhorn has invited me to these summer films. It's always a pleasure. Has anybody been here in the past years? Oh, uh, well, I guess I can't use the same jokes. <laughs> New jokes, all right. Um, many thanks to Kelly Ward, who's actually on vacation, so she's not here tonight. She's a mastermind of the summer camps, but of course, the rest of the virtual staff also uh, deserve our thanks for keeping us off the streets and out of trouble for at least three nights during the summer. This year's theme, as I said, is ape exploitation. Um, while the three movies that we're going to see, uh, Gorilla at Large tonight, that's Film, Congo next week, 1961, and Mighty Pink in Man, 1977 film, the third week. They all share a common thread or common hair, as one might say. You'll see actually three very different films over the next three weeks. We got one film from the 1950s, that's tonight, one film from the 60s, one film from the 70s, one film made in Hollywood. One film next week's made in the United Kingdom in England, and the third week a movie made in Hong Kong that has a location footage actually shot in India. So three films made in three different countries. Uh, tonight's movie is sort of a mystery thriller. Next week is a mad scientist type of tale. And uh, Mike P. King Man is a more traditional sort of King Kong giant gorilla type movie. Even the size of the apes that star in these movies uh, gradually increase from week to week. In tonight's movie, the, the gorilla is a normal sized gorilla. It's a normal size for movies. Uh, next week, in Congo, the, the uh, gorilla starts off, actually starts off as a chimpanzee and grows into a gorilla. And then by the end of the movie, it grows into a giant gorilla. And Mighty P. King Man, well, uh, he's giant gorilla, uh, gorilla monster um, throughout the whole movie, although if you see that movie, you'll notice that size tends to vary throughout the movie. Most of them, you know, unintentionally, um, you know, well, it looks like he's 20 feet tall this scene and the next scene he's 20 feet tall, but you know, it's all for fun with the movies, right? Before we uh, talk about the gorilla at large in specific, I thought I would talk about some of the fascination that the gorillas hold for us in popular culture in general. It's kind of hard to imagine today that um, gorillas, as a species, really weren't well known in outside of Africa, and outside of people who saw them every day, um, until the mid 1860s. Now, other apes were fairly well known. For example, uh, Edgar Allan Poe wrote Murders in the Rue Morgue, a story in 1841, which the central character or the killer in that particular story is Rangtang, although in movie versions of Murders in the Rue Morgue, you generally see um, it's been replaced by a gorilla. But in terms of gorillas, they really weren't well known until the mid-1860s, and they really became very popular in popular culture um, in the 20th century. Um, and you see here some examples of gorillas in popular culture. Now, chimpanzees, when we think about apes, chimpanzees, you know, they're the mischievous scamps and they're you know Tarzan's buddy and things like that. Now, gorillas, on the other hand, generally tend to be rather menacing in popular culture. Here we see um, a poster for an actual gorilla that was part of the circus in the 1930s and 1940s, and you know, he looks pretty mean and scary. They're the world's most terrifying living creature. And you also see the other is a pulp magazine from the 1940s, which has sort of an obese albino alien in Kong type of thing. Uh, so those are a couple of examples of um, popular culture of gorillas from that particular period. And to give you another idea about gorillas popular, uh, populated in popular culture, here's a comic book cover. 
covers from the 1950s and 60s. The publishers of Superman and Batman comics, DC Comics, in the 1950s they discovered that when they put a gorilla on the cover of a comic book, it sold more copies. So naturally they put gorillas on the cover of a lot of the comic books and uh, presumably made a lot of money. Now movies are no exception in terms of the fascination that they have with Ace. Um, as you can see from some of these photos, they're just a sample of the fact that they're older movies. We won't even talk about newer movies like George of the Jungle and things like that that we're really going to miss. But these are older ones, and you see there are certain motifs of city and cinema uh, that you can see from these particular ones. For example, the standard horror film trope of the monster carrying off a girl is quite visible here. But gorillas aren't fictional monsters like the Frankenstein monster, they're real animals. So why do we cast them in the monster's role, and why are we so interested in them in movies and things like that? Well, in the first place, they're anthropoids. That is, they resemble human beings, especially in the movies and popular culture when they walk up things and don't do normally in real life. Um, and they are very close. Gorillas and chimpanzees are very close genetically to human beings. But of course, as I said, in films, gorillas act both physically and emotionally much more like people than real gorillas do. Movies emphasize the kinship between apes and humans, giving them human feelings, attitudes, desires, and emotions. And we do the same to other movie animals to a certain extent, but certainly not to the same degree as we do with gorillas. And I'm not just talking about you know, Planet of the Apes that has gorillas talking and wearing clothes and things like that, but even a film like tonight's movie, Gorilla at Large, which has a, a, an allegedly realistic wild animal being kept in a cage and things like that, we'll see that this wild animal has been given human attributes in the movie. Perhaps apes in films represent the bestial side of our nature, you know, sort of the uncontrolled passions that are easier to show when we depict them coming from a human-like beast. And as I said, you see it for gorillas and the apes, you don't see bears in movies, you know, uh, carrying off women or, or acting this way. You know, it's, it's certainly there's some connection because these are human-like and yet they're, they're bestial at the same time. So without getting too psychoanalytical on you, as you can see from these posters, there are some issues with the id and the libido and things like that um, in simian cinema that might introduce interest uh, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and people like that. Okay, let's uh, spend a couple of moments on tonight's movie, Gorilla at Large. Gorilla at Large was released in 1954. It was one of about 50 3D movies that were made in the first 3D era, which was 1953-54. Now, everybody's probably seen Avatar, Shrek, and Alice in Wonderland, Clash of Titans. Uh, I've seen all of them except Shrek. Life's too short to see Shrek. Um, <laughs> in the early 1950s, there was a 3D boom as well. How do we try to use 3D to lure audiences back into the theaters and away from the free television by giving them something that television could give them, which were 3D, CinemaScope, widescreen, color. There wasn't much color television at that time. So they tried to give you something that you would pay to see. Among other 3D films of the era, you'll see here um, on the left is Moana Devil, which was a jungle movie. Uh, it was the first big 3D hit. And you don't see a gorilla, you see a lion, however, leaping out of the screen. And the other one is Phantom of the Room Lord, which was a version of Edgar Allan Poe's story, or Murders of the Lord. And as you can see from this particular ad, they sort of try to suggest that it's a monster or maybe a psycho slasher. Um, they don't want to give away the fact that at the end of the movie it actually is a gorilla who 